So Blavity started, like you said, 2014. Um, so Blavity is a media company and a platform for black culture. We focus on um, black millennials and people who care about black culture, um, which there's probably a lot of you guys here in this room. We also have a lot of other brands, so I think that's one of the things that surprises people. Um, we acquired two companies last year. One is Travel Noir, the other one is Shadow and Act. Um, and so we have lifestyle brands that really cater to black culture um, and thinking about how do we kind of holistically cr provide a platform and, and different experiences for young black people in this country. Um, so that also includes conferences. So we have Afrotech, which is a conference in, in San Francisco. It's actually next week. Uh, it'll be between three and 4,000 people. And then we have a women's conference, Summit 21, which is in Atlanta. Um, so we were just talking backstage and you were sharing with me the moment when you uh, sort of realized what Blavity needed to become. You, mm -hmm. When you left, you sort of founded it as a, as a platform. You weren't exactly sure what shape that was going to take. Right. Just, Tell us when you realized what this was and where you saw it going. Yeah, so like you said, media sucks, right? Like <laughs> starting a media company in 2014 or now is, I wouldn't necessarily advise it. Um, you know, the ad revenue is decreasing. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of challenges in terms of building on top of other platforms like Facebook and, you know, changing algorithms and all this stuff. So um, I did not want to start a media company. You know, I, I started my career in tech and in Silicon Valley. And so I really believed in creating platforms um, and creating applications and things that other people could build on top of. Um, and so when we first started, it was really um, designed around, okay, how do we create a space and online that people can come together and share their ideas and their stories? Um, and that was the original intention. Um, and, and now, four years later, we're, we're much closer there than we were when we started, because when we started, Black Lives Matter was happening and Mike Brown happened. And I was in St. Louis at the time, um, or I'm from St. Louis, but I was in San Francisco at the time, sitting in my cubicle. You know, I had uh, beer pong and dogs. and Just immersed you know, in the tech culture. I was in it. <laughs> and I did not want to be there. And I was, you know, I look like this. I was like, mm, this is not going to work. Um, this is not a place that I can thrive and be myself. And also, these are the, the customers that I'm serving are not a reflection of people that I care about. Um, and so at the same time, I was watching my city literally be on fire and then trying to stay connected with people on the ground. And because, um, you know, and this was back before Facebook had tr trending, they have trending, well, they have took it off now, but then before Twitter had the algorithm. So it was, it was also really difficult to find information. Um, and even the information you found had a lens of, other media companies that weren't a reflection of our community um, and were sensationalizing a lot of things. So the first thing that we did was say, okay, who are the people on the ground in St. Louis uh, that we can trust? And again, this was even before like DeRay and like the names that yeah. we know now, these, these were just people that were uh, making a choice to put their lives on the line um, to give information and to fight this fight. So we're like, okay, how can we, one, be a clearinghouse for truth um, for our own community so that we can help support if we're not in these cities, whether it's Baltimore, uh, Cincinnati, you know, there's so many cities that, that were on, on fire back in the day. And so, I mean, they are still now, but not necessarily part of the news cycle. Um, and so that was the first step. And then we said, okay, now we need to arm these people with ways to share their story. Um, and so Blavity became a place where we could take information and collect their like real time data, their phone numbers, whatever it is that they had, and then help disseminate that and distribute that to other people who cared, but needed a place that they could trust. And that's how the brand, I think, um, started to evolve into something that uh, really spoke to trust in, in, from a news perspective. And you know, to, to your question, that wasn't the original intention. It was not to be right. a black news company. Um, and it's something that we've grown into in the last few years. I mean, it sounds like that you know, moment of watching your city on fire and feeling like you didn't have a sense of what was going on on the ground really influenced the way that Blavity has developed in terms of how you get people to tell stories. Right. So I mean, it seems like that's also really influenced the way that you break news even today. Like mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of user generated content. So tell me about how that part yeah. of the site evolved. So Blavity, about 50% um, of our content is user generated. So people can submit stories, ideas, videos um, through our website, similar to actually how people use Medium or even Reddit. 
we have editors on the back end who review and curate and will reach out to people um, to you know, help them with their headlines or, and we fact check everything. Right. Um, and we kind of release those as, either as blogs or as op-eds on the platform. Um, it's been interesting because sometimes we, there are conflicting viewpoints, right? You know, yeah. black is not monolithic. I think that's something that uh, is told in mainstream media that, you know, all black people think this. Today, the black people think this. Today, the black people think that. That's just not what it is. We disagree with each other, yeah. right? Um, and there's so many, there's so much diversity within blackness. Um, and so just like the world, our own um, stories oftentimes conflict. And so it's been interesting to watch and to try to help our audience evolve in terms of not holding Blavity Incorporated um, accountable for yeah. the viewpoints of our demographic and, and to try to create spaces where people can have honest dialogue um, on things that they don't agree about. Right, and also understand the nuance of what is a giant community and not right. one. Um, yeah. um, so, you know, it seems like you, you know, once you decided that this is a, you, that you're going in this media direction, it's like you're sort of fighting two uphill battles at that point. You're serving an audience in a community that is underserved by legacy media organizations. Yep. And you're also creating a media company in this moment when it's really tough to do that. But you know, you're doing it from a digital first place where you have a chance to look at the mistakes of legacy media, both in the way that they are not serving this community and in their revenue model. Yep. So I'm wondering what your priorities were as you set out to build the thing that you built. And yep. you know, what you left what what you left behind and what you were eager to do more of. Yeah. So when I first started the company, I, I did not want to raise venture funding. I think that's kind of the first, was the first moment of what are we trying to do here? Um, I bootstrapped the company for a year because I wanted to make sure that what we were creating was something that had value, that we weren't artificially inflating ourselves or building something that could sell into this fake world of Silicon Valley. Um, and so that was the first thing is how do we create something that um, has trust and that our audience is going to come back to every day, weekly or daily um, to, to get access to information in this content. So once we felt like, okay, we have something that people love, then it became, okay, how do we scale in a way that is authentic with interacting with our community on a day-to-day -day basis? And that's when we started to go into lifestyle and build into like health and wellness and travel and entertainment because not everybody wants to hear about death all day, every day, you know, like yeah. you don't want to. So, and, and that's not how we live our lives. You turn on the TV, you watch Trump and you're like, mm, okay, and you move on, right? <laughs> You don't want to see it all day. And then you're on Instagram and you're like, oh, here's a funny meme and here's a funny video. And then you're on Facebook, you're like, here's this cute, you know, puppy. You're trying to get the holistic experience of delivering content. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what we found over time was that um, there was just such a hunger and a need. And we felt like originally that we could, we could use and work with creators and help them deliver their content onto our platform. But we also found out that there are stories that we need to be covering because of the resources required. Um, and so that's ultimately why we wound up you know, raising funding was so that we could make sure that we could cover the stories that were being untold um, in a way that we were proud of and that our audience could trust. So tell me about some of those stories. You know, I'm curious from your perspective, like what is a great Blavity story? What are yeah. stories that you look back on and you say that was really impactful, that was exactly the voice that we were looking for, this is the story that we needed to be telling? What are yeah. some examples of that? I'm gonna give you two. I'm gonna give you one that's user generated and then one that uh, we just did a few weeks ago. So about, what was it, two years, three years ago um, at Harvard Law School, a bunch of photos of Harvard black professors got defaced. And how many of you guys remember that story? Yeah. Um, so it you know, wound up hitting mainstream media, but in the morning of it happening, we got an email from one of the students that was there and said, you know, hey, this just happened, here's some photos, can you guys write about this? Because we're worried you know, it's not gonna get covered. Yeah. And we were like, yes, we should absolutely write this story, but it would be stronger coming from you as a student there and with your own colleagues and your friends and people that you have to go to school with every single day, and these are your future, like, colleagues in America, you guys are yeah. going to be leaders in our country, you all need to stand up. Step up and tell the story. Absolutely. In your own words. Right. Which they were nervous about, right? Because yeah. for, for obvious reasons, this is a track record online. Um, so they wrote the story um, and you know, provided us with the media and we made sure that it looked great on the website. And then we published it um, under you know, the woman's name. Um, and she 
got a lot of press coverage from that. I mean, you broke that story. Yeah, right? we broke the that, story. That was the first place. That was the first outlet yeah. that covered it. Period. Exactly. Yeah. And the, what's interesting is we have a lot of mainstream media that follows Blavity as a place right. of source of original first stories, look. right? Yeah. So I think that's something that I'm very proud of, and something that our team tries to continue to do across all of our brands, from you know Shadow and Act to Travel Noir to, of course, Blavity News. Um, the second one is, you know, just was it two weeks ago when the um, bombs were shipped to everybody's, um, not everybody, but, you know, significant members of Congress. People have been criticized. Yes. Donald Trump. Um, and so we had Auntie Maxine in, in the office that day to directly address what happened um, and to, one, tell people not to be scared, right? And, and to not change your behavior because people are trying to intimidate our community and intimidate those who are standing up for, for you know, lots of things. Um, so that was the second thing that I'm really proud of um, because we were able to provide a platform for, you know, people who are leaders within our community to say what they want to say without it being spun anyway, and they can just go directly to the audience that they care about. And then, of course, it gets picked up by CNN and all these other things, yeah. and, and you know, people have a field day with it. Um, but we want to be a place where people can come first and know that we're going to do the right thing with, with the content and their opinions. Yeah. I mean, you, t you know, when I, when I look at Blavity, the user-generated content in your social media, it's clear that you've built this really tight-knit community, that there's a lot of dialogue among the members, and like trust is obviously the coin of the realm. Without that, mm -hmm. you don't have anything. So, right. you know, as a media company in 2018, obviously you have to do advertiser integrations and sponsored content. And yeah. that, you know, that's something that is very tricky. I'd say I don't, I can't really point to examples of it being done really well anywhere. And I'm curious when trust is that important to your reader and authenticity is that important, how you're handling that. Yeah. So, we it is tough in the it's office. <laughs> like yeah. when we get um, you know RFPs and and brands come to us and they say, hey, we want to advertise you know this fried chicken thing, and we're like, mm, tell yeah. us more about how. Why, first of all, why are you coming to Blavity? Right. Right. So we we actually get really aggressive up front. Like, why are you coming to us? Um, and and then and if you guys have ever seen RFPs from like agencies, I mean, they're very descriptive. They're like, we want African American people who live in this with this amount of income. And so it's so it's we get real time information on how people are trying to sell how to our community. Yeah. yeah. And then and then also what they want us then to help them do. Um, and so it becomes actually a very heated discussion internally amongst our sales team who's doing their job trying to make sure that we hit our revenue targets, um, our content team who is very much um, wants to make sure that the content is a reflection of our values and doesn't ever come off as, as anything that is inappropriate or not something that creates value for our community. And so those conversations can often be tough. Yeah. Um, the, the guiding principle is, does this create value for our community? Um, and if the answer is no, then we let it go. Um, oftentimes, we'll say no, and the brands will be um, relatively adamant. And they'll say, well, what do we need to do to make this work? Because you know, we really want to work with you guys. And so what we try to do is say, OK, hey, how can we create value? So stop with the chicken nuggets, right? Yeah. Like, let's talk about entrepreneurship. Let's talk about job creation. Let's talk about um, financial literacy if it's a bank. No, you cannot sell credit card you know, upsells on the website. Um, let's talk about what is credit. Let's teach people things. And then if someone naturally clicks to learn more, that's fine, right? This is America. That's totally fine. But we want to do it in a way that we feel like we are teaching people um, and that it's responsible. And I mean, you have a sense that, I mean, I'm sure you hear this directly from the brands are sort of coming to you as pennants when they've been racially insensitive or in yeah. some way, or like, mm -hmm. and they're pretty direct about that. Mm -hmm. so th this is why they're coming to you. Yeah, so we've had some people, and I won't call out any brands, but there's people who, um, they have like bubblings of things happening in their stores, and they're like, mm, if this breaks, we need a, clear place to go from a communications perspective to say, oh, well, we're working with Blavity, right? So um, usually in those cases, we, are, we seek to understand and actually figure out why are you coming to us um, and you know, decline or accept accordingly. And then secondly, if people have already messed up, right, and they're training on Twitter and black Twitter has gone after them, um, it just comes back to value. Well, what are you willing to do? 
right? Are, are you going to be like Starbucks, where you shut everything down um, and you change your policies inside your, your stores and you train people? Instantly oh. and without the fake apology. First. Right. Yeah, and you have your CEO and your founder, right? Cool. I can get behind that. Okay. Um, are you going to be like Waffle House, right? Who are you going to be? Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that, that we talk a lot about. Um, so, I'm, you know, a lot of the, like, black media mainstays, especially the print and pre-internet brands, are really in trouble today. Yeah. So I'm curious, you know, what lessons you've learned from them and what and how you're looking to sort of avoid that fate. Yeah, they, they are in trouble. Um, some, most of them have been bought in the last, or, yeah, in the last, what, like three, four years. Um, what have I learned from them? I have learned to constantly uh, question are we creating stories that people are engaging with at a high level? And are we not chasing, let's make sure we're not chasing celebrities. I think a lot of times people get caught up in um, getting the biggest names from TV and Hollywood. Um, and for like the millennial and the younger generation, they don't really give shit, right? Like they don't really care if you have a TV yeah. show or not. They care more about, are you interesting? Are you funny? Do you have something to say? Are you speaking up for things? Are you speaking up for issues that they care about? And so as we continue to evolve and even our staff gets older, um, you know, we hire 18 year olds. We have college students that are in the office all the time just to make sure that um, our content is in direct like relation to what's important to our community. Um, and the second thing is uh, evolving our, our business models, right? So instead of only building a business that is reliant on these 10 to 20 big advertisers, your huge Fortune 500 companies, what are other companies that we can work with that um, we're gonna be able to grow with at an earlier stage, right? I might try to work with a Soul Cycle or an Away mm -hmm. before I would try to work with a Marriott or Coca-Cola. Because in 10 years from now, a way maybe bigger than American Airlines. I mean, it may not be, but yeah. Um, and it seems like you guys have done a good job from the get-go of getting into the events business, also mm -hmm. conferences. So I mean, tell us a little bit about your events. I think some yeah. people don't realize that that's also part it's of huge. the blavity. Yeah, so we make you know multi millions on our revenue from a from our events. So both in ticket sales and of course in sponsorships and advertising. So a lot of times when we work with we partner with companies, they want to go deep with our audience. They want to go deep with the black community, and so we'll work with them to say, okay, why don't you come to Afrotech? Um, we'll do a big activation there. Let's do four or five articles on the site. Let's also do we have newsletters, right? We have we email four to five hundred thousand people a day in our daily emails. So let's then. And also run that content through each one of our platforms and lifestyle brands, which don't necessarily overlap audiences. Um, and so that is kind of, I think, differentiated us from a lot of other black media companies and media companies in general. Um, and then the conferences are really great because it provides an opportunity for people to come together and, and to have community. You know, people, I think, feel lonely in this country yeah. and in their offices and their cubicles on their way to work. And having a one time a year or two times a year where you can go and see all your friends, it's like a homecoming. What's Hang up? <laughs> right, just like we're here this weekend. So um, that is something that I think provides huge value outside of just that day-to-day -day interaction on your phone. Um, and it's been growing really fast. Um, I have one more question for you and then we're gonna open up for questions from the audience, um, which will be at the two microphones that they're gonna bring down here, I believe. Um, what, what area, you know, you guys are doing a lot of culture, politics, mm -hmm. opinion, story, video. What, what area are you looking to expand and what, what's next for Blavity? Yeah, so I would say video, which is interesting because um, we didn't do video when everyone else did. One, we couldn't afford it. We didn't have any money. Um, but two, I wasn't really convinced that like Snapchat and uh, even like these Facebook watch shows were going to actually uh, be something that the consumer wanted to engage with. I knew that the platforms with the algorithms were going to make sure that we saw you know Facebook watch and shows frequently. Um, but we weren't, I, would, I don't think that, um, long form video content on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat makes sense. It's not, I don't think it's It just doesn't make yeah. any sense, you know, and they're gonna push it and keep pushing it, right? Um, so we didn't do that, um, which I think saved us a lot of money and a lot of time. We didn't have to lay off any people. Um, but now with uh, Instagram video, actually, and, and just the, the feed, I think, is going to continue to be something how people interact um, with video content. And so we're investing a lot on short form 
video content. And a lot of it is fun. A lot of it is based in GIFs and memes um, and, and some storytelling, but nothing over two to three minutes. So you'll see a lot of that from us in the future. Awesome. I'm psyched to watch it. Yeah. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Do we have any out here? You can step up to the mic right there. Hi, Morgan. Hi. What are you doing around intersectionality of like the Afro-Latina experience and yeah. bridging with other communities? Yeah, great question. Um, we are doing a lot of things. We just don't. Um, so one of the things when we experiment at Blavity is we oftentimes create sub-brands that you guys don't know are ours, and we test things without you know having the spotlight on it. Um, so Afro-Latina community is something that we think a lot about. We have probably around 10, 20 percent of our audience, and. Um, even within our own company who identifies Afro-Latina. So you'll see some stuff. Hopefully it'll bubble to the surface next year. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great question. Um, I was wondering if you could get into a little more detail than that's and bolts of you described a, running a media company is very challenging in this environment. What are the things that worked well driving revenue? What are some of the things you tried that didn't work yeah. um, for somebody who, you know, and people in the audience who may be at the very beginning stage of a newsletter or something else like that? Yeah, great question. So I'll just walk you through exactly how we started to make money. So um, my first check was an Instagram ad. Somebody was like, hey, can we run ads on Instagram? And I was like, I don't know how much we charge for that. <laughs> you know, and it was like $500 at the time. It was like way back in the day. Um, and so that was the first thing was, OK, do we have enough scale on one platform for people to be willing to pay for this? That, that's kind of my first piece of feedback for people who are running media companies. A lot of times people try to grow scale across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like all these things at once. Do not do that. Get one thing big, sell that, and then use that revenue and, and whatever profit you have to then go and invest and scale other platforms. Um, if you're going to bootstrap it, this is the bootstrap story. Um, and then the, the second thing was, OK, we're kind of big for some indie brands to want to advertise with us, but if we ever want to get to these big Fortune 500, you know, six-figure, seven-figure deals, I need uh, a lot of scale online to get there, and that was going to take us some time. And so uh, I said, okay, well, what are people comfortable giving 20K, 30K, 40K for? Events. They're comfortable um, for a three or 400 person event being a sponsor and a partner. And it's something that people already kind of have an understanding of what the return of investment is. They're not questioning impressions. They're, it's, it's very like, my logo was on the stage, I'm happy. Um, and so our first real chunk of money came from, from running a women's conference, which is called Empower Her, which is the first version of Summit 21, our women's conference. Um, and then from there, it was really actually the conferences and events wound up being a, an amazing way to engage with our clients in a low risk way because they could put in 10 to 20K and then they got to see the life of our people, of our community. Like they could to see everybody smiles. They got to see everyone really spending time with their brands and interacting with their products. And then they felt comfortable saying, okay, let's do a video series. Let's then go do you know, an article series. Um, and, and so a lot of our relationships started at, at the events level. Um, and those are only two to 300 people events. It was very reasonable. Um, and then from there, display advertising. Um, you know, we just started to do programmatic and header bidding. We were doing mostly direct deals, which I would encourage because it, again, you have those those one-to-one -one relationships with brands and clients. And if you're building a niche media company, a company that is focused on a specific demographic, you need to be in direct conversation with your clients because you want to help them understand um, and need to have a conversation. If you have an agency intermediary, then you're not going to have a loyal client necessarily. Next question. Thanks for coming. What would your advice be to early content creators when like, I like what you said where you, they don't have to be celebrity, it's about story. But still, with my 14 subscribers on my channel, how do I approach somebody to come on when the qualitative, quantitative value difference is so disparate? Yeah, that's a great question. So I typically recommend people start just like one or two weight classes above you. So if you have, um, I recommend partnering with other content creators first before you try to go after like brands and platforms. Um, so if you have a thousand YouTube subscribers and you want to partner with your buddy who has 4,000 YouTube subscribers, okay, you guys aren't one-to-one, -one, right? So maybe you need to post two times or three times as frequently so that he can get the value or she can get the value from that partnership and relationship. And, and also, 
okay, if your platform is really big on YouTube and theirs is really big on Instagram, then maybe you guys, you're gonna post your stuff there and they're gonna post their stuff, right? And so um, try to provide double the value if you're a little bit smaller and then you'll grow. You know, you'll grow organically and that's just, that's just part of the, the grind. Thank you, next question. Could you comment on or perhaps share an anecdote that illustrates some of the challenges you faced raising venture capital money? Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> 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 oh man, um, yeah, raising is the worst. Like, I mean, I know people, you, I've gotten feedback that I shouldn't say that on stage because you're not supposed to say it. But I really think that um, people should know that it is difficult for everyone. You know, these stories about like, the white boy had a napkin and he got a million dollars. Like, you know, that happens, but it doesn't really happen that way. Like, you still have to do a ton of work no matter who you are. Um, and particularly once you get beyond the million dollar check, when you get into four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, thirty million dollars, um, there is a lot of things that go into that. Um, so when I first started, when I first started the company and then made the decision to raise after being very resistant to it, uh, I did what I think a lot of people do. I went after investors who look like me and who I thought understood what I was building. And I got rejected by every single one of them. Um, and I was emotionally just beat down because I felt like if black investors don't get it, how is it possible that I can go to Sand Hill Road and they're gonna get it? Um, and so I just stopped raising and went, put my head back down and, and started to build the business even more. Um, and it was only until I had people really advocating for me and saying, Morgan, you have to raise. Like this is, you are slowing down the business and there are people who will invest in you. Um, and I changed the type of investor profile that I went after. I went after investors who cared about the value of Blavity. They cared about, hey, even if we're not Uber, you know, if we're not Pinterest and Uber and these, you know, unicorn type companies, um, you existing, Blavity existing and, and being a part of the media landscape and the tech landscape is going to keep pushing things forward and is going to provide value in a way that can still be a significantly large business. And once I started to talk to investors um, that aligned with those types of values, it became much easier of a conversation. Um, and by then our numbers were so ridiculous because you know, we were just working um, that they're like, is this real? And I was like, it's real, yeah. They're like, you have Facebook ads? I was like, what's a Facebook ad? Like I had no idea because I wasn't trying to build a media company. So um, that would be you know, my advice to people who are in a position where you feel like you have an idea, you have something that doesn't fit the norm. And, and so investors may not get it in the beginning. Um, try to, to identify people who share the same values as your company and your mission. Um, and funds that, that also share that, and it makes the conversation a little bit easier. I'm wondering if you got, were there any like stumbles along the way, any things you wish you could redo that you learned from that were particularly instructive? Uh, yeah, you know, we, cash flow is a thing. So one of the things as a, a media company, oftentimes you have big deals with huge companies um, and they're like net 150, 145, right? So they don't pay you until like after the campaign has happened and then they go through their accounts receivable and all this thing. Um, and as a company who didn't raise that much in the beginning, I didn't, I didn't take that in consideration when doing our projections and we were growing so fast that we had all these great deals. Like who says no to Buick? Who says no to Coca-Cola, right? You say, yes, yes, yeah. I want all these For checks. Sure. Oops, wait, now we have to go make the content, build those teams, uh, and then we need to figure out how to collect the money back. So even just the details of running um, a fast growing media company on the operational side was, were quite difficult and, and things that, there's definitely mistakes that we made along the way that you know, could have drowned us um, at such a young stage. And how many employees are you now in total? 55, full time, yeah. Wow. And how is, that, how is that distributed? How many are editors, how many? Yeah, so most of them are in uh, sales, operations, um, and now engineering. So we're based, headquartered here in LA, down the street, um, downtown. And then we also have an office that we just opened up in Atlanta, which will be focusing on engineering and design. Um, and yeah, it's been a fun ride, kind of building a inclusive comp tech company of the future. You know, most of our employees have never, this is their first job. Um, and first job period, not just first job. First job that. ever. So their perception and having worked in a job that doesn't look like mine, right, where I don't have managers, um, like most of my, all 
I'd say almost all of my directors are women. Um, and so it's a very progressive workplace. Um, but then we have like a layer of employees where that's all they've ever known. And so the things they complain about, they're like, there's not enough bananas today. And I'm just like, <laughs> but we're women. Like, You're you know, like, we're good. You know, like, a big surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, and then vice versa for those who have been in a workplace for 10, 15 years, they come in and they're like, this is insane. You know, that I can come to work and be my full self, that I can tell my employer that I'm pregnant, you know, four weeks in and it's not a thing. Like, you know, that is, um, I think, something that's really freeing in our space and something I'm excited to see kind of as I continue to grow as a CEO and not just a founder, um, help continue to make sure our culture stays that way as we get bigger. And Advertech is next week, right? You're big. It is in services. four days. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I'm sure you have your hands full. Um, I just want to thank you so much for being here with us and yeah. for sharing all that with us. Good luck next week. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Sam.